Thanks for joining us at Dream City Online. Stay connected by downloading the Dream City Omaha app. And don't forget to subscribe for all our latest videos. Amen. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody, how's everybody doing today? Did anybody else lose their voice watching the 49ers game last night? Just me. Okay, I'm the only one. I do have my tea up here today. Normally, I don't bring anything up here with me, but today uh, I needed some tea. I took it easy on first service because I knew you guys were coming, and I wanted to save some in the tank for you guys. And so uh, we're going to we're gonna get into God's Word this morning. Before we do, how many of you guys are math people? Like, math is easy for you, just comes natural. You see things that way. You think that way. Come on. All you, all you, all you nerds like me, go ahead and raise your hand. Raise it high. Rock proud. How many of you guys are like, absolutely not, if I never have to do another equation or solve another function or another proof, and some of you are like, I didn't even make it that far in math, so I don't know what you're talking about right now. Non-math people, raise your hand. Come on. Like, you hate, okay, awesome. Those of you that are math people and those of you even that are not math people, uh, question for you this morning, do you know how to make seven, the number seven, obviously it's, a, it's an odd number, uh, do you know how to make seven even? Take away the S. <laughs> Take away the S, E-V-E-N. Some of you, I know, some of you are like, I only thought there were X's and Y's in math equations. I didn't know there were S's. Make seven even, you take away the S. For those of you that are just joining us today, we start every week with just a, a dad joke. Why? Because laughter prepares the brain for learning. It gets your brain firing. And so wanting to, to help you get, uh, get ready to learn from God's Word this morning, we've been reading through the New Testament, specifically the book of Luke. We uh, began at the beginning of the year with our yearly reading plan. And if you haven't joined us to this point, would encourage you, jump on in. We're three weeks into the reading plan, so it's not too late. Our reading plan is one chapter a day through the New Testament. By the end of the year, we'll have read through the entirety of the New Testament. And then as we gather at church on Sundays, we'll be teaching through a passage of scripture that we read that week. And along with that, we, we've got two memory verses every week. So we're memorizing two verses. And by the end of the year, all of our, our verses that we've committed to memory will be Matthews chapter 5, 6, and 7, which is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and so, so we've been reading first week, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, the memorization. Jesus, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And here's what he said. That's verses 1 and 2. And then verses 3 and 4, he gets into what are known as the Beatitudes. And we've remembered this. We've memorized this. You guys all know this. The first one, blessed are who? The poor in spirit. Very good. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The second is blessed are who? Those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. Good. We're memorizing together. So the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And then this week was verses 5 and 6. Verse 5 says blessed are who? The meek because they will inherit the earth. And then verse 6, blessed are who? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Give yourselves a hand. That's awesome. And so right now we're, we're going through that. And again, would encourage you, even if you're visiting and you want to you wanna join along with that, the reading plan uh, is on the app and it's on the website. You can download that and follow along with us every week. There's five days of reading and just one chapter every week. And then you get two days off to either catch up or just to, to focus on the memorization. But this morning as we get into uh, some of our reading for this week, we're going to be in Luke chapter 13 if you want to turn your Bibles there or if you want to open your app and flip there. Uh, we've been reading for three weeks as Jesus has begun his earthly ministry. We see in the beginning of, of the Gospel of Luke, he tells us the story of Jesus' birth in chapters 1 and 2. And then we see John the Baptist in, in Luke chapter 3 preparing the way. Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, he came and he was out in the wilderness, out in the country, and he was preaching, repent, for the kingdom is near. So he's preparing the way for Jesus to begin his earthly ministry and, and calling people to this, this attitude and lifestyle of repentance. Now, repentance, we know, is not just being sorry for what you've done. It's not feelings of remorse, but repentance is actually, it was a, a Greek military term, the word that is used, and it means to do really an about face. 
to have a change of mind that leads to a change in direction. So repentance looks like I'm living my life one way. I encounter Jesus like, like Saul did, who became Paul on the road to Damascus. Have an encounter with Jesus, repent of my sin, so I'm not going to go that way anymore. Changing my mind, God help me change my actions. That's what true repentance is. And so John comes and he preaches, repent for the kingdom is near. And then Jesus, he, he, he begins to teach about the kingdom and he begins to heal people and, and minister, bringing the God's kingdom to earth. And we see his disciples asking him, how should we pray? Pray this way, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. So he's, he's praying about the kingdom. And later when Jesus gets arrested, he'll be standing before Pilate. And Pilate will ask him, you know, they say that you're the king of the Jews. And he says, my kingdom is not of this earth, is Jesus' response. Later in the Acts, Luke wrote, Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke records in Luke chapter 1 that after Jesus resurrected for 40 days, he walks with his disciples. And it says that he spoke to them about what? The kingdom. So he, he is, has shown them the kingdom. He's taught them about the kingdom. He's, he's gone to the cross. He's risen from the dead. He's getting ready to go back to the Father. But let me first take a month and a half to make sure they know about the kingdom. Chapter 1, verse 4 of Acts, he's, he's speaking to them about the kingdom. Four verses later, Jesus is getting ready to ascend to the Father. And his disciples ask him, is now the time you're going to give the kingdom back to Israel? And if I was Jesus and I, if I was there, I could imagine the look on Jesus' face would be the same as some of your parents when your teenager says, I didn't hear you tell me to do that. Like, really? Have you been there? You feel like you're talking to a brick wall at times and it's like, I've told you seven times. Jesus is like, I've walked with you for three years. I've told you parable after parable, given you example after example told you it's not about an earthly kingdom, but it's about, it's about a heavenly kingdom. It's about a kingdom in your hearts that I'm trying to establish. I've been with you for the last seven weeks talking to you about the kingdom, and now you want to know when I'm, when I'm, when I'm going to get Rome out of here? Have you missed everything that I've told you over the last three years? Jesus came, and he, he taught about the kingdom and sought to bring about the kingdom. And we, as followers of Jesus, our mission and our mandate is to be ambassadors of this kingdom. And if we're to be ambassadors of this kingdom, if Jesus' ministry was about establishing the kingdom, we need to know what the kingdom is and how the kingdom functions and how it operates. And it's in that, that with that foundation that Jesus in Luke chapter 13 gives two different parables of what the kingdom of God is like. Luke chapter 13, we're gonna begin reading in verse number 18. Jesus says this, what is the kingdom of God like? How can I illustrate it? How can I put this in, in, a, in a way that you will, you will understand what the kingdom is like? Here's what he says. It's like, what is it like? It's like a mustard seed. And I can imagine the people who were in the synagogue that day listening to Jesus were kind of like, what? No, 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 hear me out. It's, it's like a mustard seed. And you, you, know, you, you look at the seed, and it's a, a tiny seed that a man planted in a garden, and it grows, and it becomes a tree, and the birds make nests in its branches. That's what the kingdom is like. And the look on the people's face that day is probably similar to the look on your face today, like, not following. I don't really get it. He's like, okay, maybe the mustard seed didn't do it for you. Let's see, what can, I, what can I compare it to? What metaphor can I use? Why, what is the kingdom like? He continues, he says, he says, it's like this. It's like the yeast that a woman used in making bread. And even though she only uses a little yeast in three measures of flour, it, it permeates every part of the dough. That's what the kingdom is like. What? Can you start over again? Like, I don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. See, Jesus uses parables oftentimes when he teaches because he's, he's taking kingdom ideas and kingdom principles, and he tells stories, uses metaphors, different situations to communicate a kingdom principle with, with an earthly 
natural illustration, and that's what Jesus is doing here. As we read the Gospel of Luke, I want you to understand and, and want you to be looking for it, for, for it in the text. Understand, every gospel was written to a different audience, right? Matthew's gospel was written to a Jewish audience. And so Matthew is communicating. It takes a lot of time and a lot of care communicating that Jesus was of of Abrahamic descent. He was of Davidic descent. Jesus was the Messiah, the one who was promised to come to take away the sin of the world. He was the son of God. And and so, so because he's writing to a Jewish audience, he's using Jewish terms and Jewish ideas to communicate who Jesus is. Luke's not writing to a bunch of Jews. He's writing to a bunch of Gentiles. And so he's comparing and contrasting more than in any other gospel. What Luke will do is he'll take two different stories or two different settings and scenarios and use them to contrast Really, a lot of the time, what he's contrasting is this earthly religious system that had been distorted from how God intended and what Jesus was trying to teach. See, he, he wasn't writing to Jews about the, the, the Pharisees and this religiosity that had permeated. Why? Because they lived it, they knew it, they didn't, they didn't need to be convinced of that. But he's writing to a group of Gentiles who they know about temples and and worship, an established religious system. So when, when Luke is, is writing to, to tell them about the difference of this man named Jesus and what he taught, he does a lot of compare and contrast. We saw it last week, right? Simon the Pharisee and the sinful woman who washes Jesus' feet. He compares and he contrasts the two. You didn't give me water to wash my feet, but she's washing my feet with her tears. You didn't greet me, but she's been kissing my feet. You didn't give me oil for my head, but she anointed my feet with this expensive perfume. Comparing and contrasting the two. We see it in, in Mary and Martha. You know, one who's sitting at Jesus' feet, one who is busy working and slaving away and tell her to come and help me. It's not fair. And Jesus says, no, she's found the better of the two and I'm not gonna take that away from her. Later in our reading, we'll see in Luke 16, the, the rich man in Lazarus, comparing and contrasting. In Luke 18, the tax collector and the Pharisee. Even in Luke's gospel, the, the two criminals who hang next to Jesus, they're mentioned in the other gospels, but he compares the attitudes and the mindsets of the two. We're not really given a look into these men other than in the gospel of Luke when one man kind of condescendingly says, Jesus, you know, if you were, and the other man saying, shut up, you don't know what you're talking about. Jesus says, one of you will be with me in paradise today. Why? Comparing and contrasting the two. So he's always creating this tension in the text between, between two contrasting ideas and he, he creates this tension and then just kind of serves it to you and it's like, what do we do with that? And that's the, the process that as followers of Christ, we go through. That's why we study the scripture. Like, okay, okay, I'm challenged in this, but now what am I supposed to do with this? So we see Jesus giving these two parables. Kingdom is like a mustard seed. Kingdom is like yeast. But we have to, to really understand what's going on. We have to go back a little bit before that because just before Jesus teaches this way, he's in the synagogue on the Sabbath and there's a woman who, who needs healing. She needs a miracle. Jesus, he heals her miraculously. It's not the first time. It won't be the last time Jesus heals on the Sabbath, makes somebody upset, but he heals on the Sabbath. And the, the pastor of that area, the synagogue leader in that area, he stands up and he condemns Jesus and not just Jesus, but the people as well. The woman who got healed. He says, listen, it's the Sabbath. You shouldn't be doing this on the Sabbath. In fact, here's what he says. Go, go to the, there he is. The leader in charge of the synagogue. He was indignant that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. Here's what he says to the people. There's six days to do work. If you want to be healed, come on one of those days. Like, could you imagine? Could you imagine if Jesus let this stand and let people think that the kingdom of God was like this? Like, okay, God, I, I need you. God, I need a miracle. I need a miracle in my home, in my family, in my marriage, in my finances, whatever the case may be. But I don't know if I can come to you right now. I don't know. I don't know if now's the right time. I don't know if this is what's proper. And this happens in, in this way. Imagine you coming to church on Sunday and coming down and saying, Pastor, uh, you know, I, I just got a call from the doctor and I just, I just want somebody to pray for me. 
And I said, you know what? My hours are Monday through Friday, nine to five. Why don't you come back one of those days? Come back during office hours and I'll pray for you. How many of you would be finding a new church the next day? <laughs> I would be finding a new church. I would remove myself. And yet that's the attitude, that's the religious system that is operating in this day. And so this happens, this, the, the people are seeing this happen and they're like, man, Jesus just did a great thing for this woman, but now he's getting scolded. Is that really what God's heart is? And then Jesus, in this context, it says, then Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? Well, it's like mustard seed. It's the smallest of the seeds, but you plant it and it turns into a big tree and birds come and find shelter in it, take comfort in it, find refuge in it. It's provision, it provides shade. When the sun is, is hot, it's like a mustard seed. What does that mean? Well, okay, let me put it this way. It's like yeast. You know, you, you put the yeast in the dough when you mix the dough and put the dough in the oven. You come back, you look a couple minutes later and it's risen a little bit and it's risen a little bit more until it's, until it's done, until it's ready. And the same way that just a little bit of yeast will permeate the whole loaf, will transform the entire lump of dough into something beautiful. That's what, that's what the kingdom of God is like. It's comparing and contrasting the established religious system of the day with, with what he came to preach, and that was the kingdom. So two things we see today. We see, number one, the potential of the mustard seed, and we see the power of the yeast. The potential of the mustard seed. And the mustard seed, this isn't the only time Jesus uses the mustard seed as a metaphor. He will later say, you know, if you have the faith, the, just the size of a mustard seed, just a little bit of faith. Now, why, why a mustard seed, right? Like it reminds me of, of Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Anyone ever seen that? Kevin Costner, greatest Robin Hood movie ever made. Don't come at me with men in tights. That doesn't even count. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, right? In, in the Sheriff of Nottingham, he, he says, you know, I'm gonna cut his heart out with what? With a spoon. And his cousin's like, why a spoon, cousin? Why not a knife or an ax? He says, because it's dull, you twit. It will hurt more. Thank you for quoting along with me. <laughs> Why a spoon? And I think, I think if we were there, and I think maybe even for some of us today, we hear that and it's like, why a mustard seed? I don't get it. Because it was the smallest of all the seeds. Now, we know today it's not the smallest seed in existence, but in their region, in their part of the world, in the agrarian society that they were, working the land, tilling the land, planting crops, taking... The mustard seed was the smallest seed that they knew of. So when he says it's, it's like a mustard seed, they would have had the thought like, that's kind of small. Like that's it? Well, it, it's like that in the sense that something so small when planted in good soil and watered and, and taken care of, begins to produce something so great as a mustard tree. See, the smallest seed produced the biggest shrub in their gardens. The mustard tree is not how we think of trees, like maple trees or cottonwoods or oak trees. It's, it's really like, it's like if you have that neighbor that has the overgrown bushes that take over their entire, it's like that. That's what a mustard tree looks like, just a, an overgrown bush that the birds will come and take refuge in and build their nests in. And so he's saying something so small, but yet it makes something so great. That's what the kingdom is like. And when you think about it, it is really, right? Like you think about, you think about the, the, the beginning of our faith. You think about the virgin birth. You think about the fact that Jesus, when he came, as the one through whom all things were created and all things were made, this King of Kings, Lord of Lords, stepped out of eternity and wasn't born to, to a Caesar. He wasn't born to a world leader. He wasn't born into royalty. He wasn't born with, with royal blood in his veins. He was born 
to a teenage mom. Not only that, he was born in a barn. Literally, Jesus, the only kid when asked, were you born in a barn? Could say, yes, I was. In fact, excuse me while I leave the door open. He was born in a barn. Have you ever, have you ever been on a trip with your kids or you, you've taken them to a different part and it's like, hey, you see that house? It's the house I grew up in. Your kids are like, really? <laughs> like, yeah, I remember that hill being bigger or I remember, you know, just you, you remember it different. I, I imagine Jesus, not that he had kids, but he kind of did with his disciples. I imagine, you know, Jesus traveling with them. He's like, hey guys, see that barn? I was born in that barn. That's, that's the barn I was born in. The humble beginnings. You think about the men that Jesus chose, these men who were overlooked by society. Literally the last ones picked for the dodgeball team. Because in that day and age, every young man wanted to, to be the disciple of a great rabbi, of a great teacher. And so what would happen is they would go through formal education. And when they were graduated formal education, the rabbis and the teachers would come and they would say, I see potential in you. I see potential in you. I think you could be one of my followers. Why don't you come and be my disciple? And the ones who weren't picked went to work with their dads, went to go be a part of the family business. So here's this, this young group of men literally overlooked by society. And Jesus says, you know what? I'm going to pick you. He didn't go to the honor roll list. <laughs> Thank God he didn't, because I wouldn't have been there. He, he, didn't, he didn't look for the best and brightest. He didn't host Israel's Got Talent to see who were going to be the ones. Like, it was none of that. He said, who are the ones that have been overlooked and outcast and cast aside? Those are the ones that I want. Why don't you come and follow me? I think I could do something with you. Humble beginnings. And then these 12 men became 70. 70 disciples and followers who Jesus would send out and say, go into all of the village, talk to them about the kingdom, tell them about me, tell them what we're doing, cast out any demons, heal, heal the sick, do, do, do whatever you felt led, led to do. Turns into the hundred in the upper room on the day of Pentecost filled with the Holy Spirit. Steps out onto the street, Peter begins to preach and as he preaches, there's this, an altar call at the end and the Bible says that 3,000 were added to their number that day. A couple days later, they're at the temple. They heal this man. Jesus heals this man through Peter and John. And Peter preaches and says, it's not because of me. It's because of Jesus in me. Jesus of Nazareth, the same Jesus that, by the way, you killed. And upon hearing this message, the Bible says their number grew that day to 5,000. Not 5,000 people, but 5,000 men. Not counting women and children. Probably more like fifteen to 20,000. And we see this this this. this rapid, exponential growth to where now here we are 2,000 years later in literally every, every area and aspect of our daily lives have been impacted by the kingdom of God. Every, every aspect of our daily lives. You can't go into a hospital without seeing the dedication plaque, without reading the mission statement. Why? Because Jesus is the great physician. Because they were founded to, to carry on this mission of, of caring for people, tending to needs, looking out for the least of them. You, you look at all of the, the, the original universities that were founded in this country, in Europe. And I know today we're like, well, you know, Colleges, I'm not really sure. I want to send my kid to a state university. It's getting kind of crazy. But, but when you look at their founding documents, when you look at their original mission statement, it was all about the kingdom of God. Founded on these principles. Go back and look. I, I challenge you to do that. Literally every area of your daily life has been impacted for the better because of the message of Jesus Christ. Because of the one who was born in a barn to a teenage mom with a bunch of sheep watching. The humble beginnings that now literally millions of people around the globe gather together and worship him. Why? Because the kingdom of God is like, it's like a mustard seed. And it might be small and it might seem insignificant, but once planted, it's able to bring about something 
something bigger than itself. Well, what does that mean for me? It means this, that if you allow the kingdom of God to take root in your life, that God is able to, to take that and transform and bring about growth that you've never experienced and you've only imagined. It means this, that those small, seemingly insignificant decisions that you're faced with every day are not so small or insignificant. Can I tell you that there's no such thing as an insignificant choice? Your life is the culmination of all of those little choices that you've made along the way. Amen. And sometimes we come to church and it's like, you know, <laughs> Pastor, you don't know the weight that I carry, right? Like you don't know everything I'm dealing with. You don't know everything I'm going through. You don't, you don't know the fight I got into with my spouse last week. You don't, you don't, you don't know the, the tears that I've cried. You don't know the burden that I've had to carry. What's this one little, one chapter? You want me to read the Bible? You want me to read one chapter a day? What difference is that going to make when faced with all of the things that I'm going through? Can I tell you, it can make all the difference in the world. What different, you want me to go to a small group one night a week for an hour and, and get around people, half of whom I don't even like? And you, and you, want, me to, you, want, me to, you want me to encourage these people and, and, and do life with these people? I, I don't see how that's going to help me. Well, you don't see what's happening beneath the ground as that mustard seed begins to to develop roots and begins to sprout. But the next thing you know, you turn around and here's this tree and there's all these birds making a nest in it. That's what the kingdom is like. That as the seed of God's word goes forth, may your heart be that fertile soil. Say, God, take root in my life. And even though it seems small and even though it seems insignificant, I know that it's not because you said your kingdom would work in this way. And it starts small and it starts humbly, but it produces something great in our lives if we would just allow it to do that. You ever heard the saying, big things come in small packages? I mean, we, all, we all know that, that saying. I think if Jesus were were alive today, he'd probably, you know, say, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like, you know, big things that come in small packages. If I were to tell you what the kingdom of heaven was like today, I would say the kingdom of heaven is like a window regulator. Does anybody know what a window regulator is? Okay, three of you. One, because I told you this week what it is. How many of you guys have power windows in your car? You push the button, the window goes up, push the button, window goes down. Come on, raise them up. I know, it's all of you, right? Some of you are like, you think I crank? I don't crank. I haven't cranked since 92. I push the button, it goes down. I pull the button, it comes up, and I'm so fancy. I've got the auto. I just have to push it once. I don't even have to hold it. I push it, and I watch. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. You know what the, what, what, what's happening as you push that button? On the inside of your door panel, there is a little motor that is mounted inside that connects to a window regulator. And when you push the button, there's an electrical signal that goes to the motor that tells it to kick on. And there's this little, this little gear that begins to spin. And on the inside, inside of your door panel, there's this regulator. And as the, the, the motor spins, it begins to turn. And as it turns, it either tightens or loosens these wires on the inside to regulate your window. The kingdom of heaven is like a window regulator. I don't understand. Because you don't even think, you don't think about it. You don't see it. You don't know what's taking place. None of y'all even knew what a window regulator was. But can I tell you, from very personal experience, that winter driving in Omaha, Nebraska, a window regulator may be the single most important piece of equipment in your vehicle. <laughs> Friday night, Carter with his Campus Life, which is a Christian group that, that meet at the, the, the middle school, 
his group had rented out one of the trampoline parks in town. And so him and his buddies were going. And so I, I was the dad on drop-off duty. There was another dad on pickup duty. But at 9.30 at night, I had to drive these kids 20 minutes across town to drop them off at this park. Well, I'm driving a, car, a truck full of, 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 of boys and it's cold outside. My dashboard says it's negative five. And they're all, you know, sweaty and hormonal teenage boys. So the windows are fogging up. So what do you do? You blast the defroster. Had the defrost blasting, wasn't really working all that well. So what do we do when our defroster isn't working? Crack the window. So I cracked the window about three, four inches. Windows cleared up. I'm good to go. Let me just with my fancy auto button, go ahead and pull that up. Uh. Let me try that again. Pulled it up, nothing happened. So, so I had the idea, and this is probably where I messed up, that there's, there, maybe there's something, maybe there's something like stuck in the tracks, you know, it's been cold, or maybe there's some dirt in there. Maybe if I, if I go down a little bit past where it's at now and give it some momentum on the way up, maybe it just needs a little momentum to help it come on up to the top. So I go down about halfway and I hit the button and it's, uh, and I turned around and said, boys, it's gonna be really cold for the next 15 minutes. And as we drove with the window half down, the, the boys in the back, Logan was in the back seat right behind me. And he's sitting back there shaking and shivering because you know, no middle schooler wears a jacket or pants outside. <laughs> so he's in the back with like t-shirt and shorts. On. I'm like, yeah, this is why your mom told you to wear a jacket. Maybe next time you will. <laughs> You're welcome. See, it's just for you. So we're freezing. We get to the place. They get out. Like, go in, have fun. I can't even think straight right now. So then I'm like, well, maybe it just needs some help up. So if I pull the window and pull the button, maybe that'll take care of my problem. Made the problem worse. And then I let go of the window, and the window just goes <laughs> all the way to the bottom. Dropped it like it was hot. Sorry, is that too much? <laughs> Probably shouldn't have. Probably. <laughs> Holy Spirit, why didn't you catch that one? You should have caught that one all the way to the bottom. So I had to drive home Friday night, negative five degrees, and it's freezing. I come to a stoplight. I'm at a fork in the road because I can go to the expressway. I can drive down the expressway and probably get home five minutes quicker. But I'm going to be driving faster, which means more air in, or I can go slower, take more time, but maybe not get as cold. It was lose-lose. Got home and for the next two days, took my door apart, figured it out. One, lo one, 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 little, one little tab on the inside had come loose, allowed it to unspool to where I was freezing on my way home. The kingdom of heaven is like a window regulator. You don't see it working. You don't always hear it working. But if your faith is placed in the right thing at the right time, it can make all the difference in the world. What difference? Just something so small. I know it's something so small, but trust me. Trust me. You're going to need it. You're going to want it. You're going to wish you had it. And it's not until you don't have it that you regret not taking care of it in the first place. It's not until those who stand before God on that day and they hear, depart from me. I never knew you. Man. I wish I would have changed the oil sooner. Man, I wish I would have taken better car care. Man, I, I wish I would have just allowed. Man, I wish I had that. It's so small, but it literally makes all the difference. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Seems insignificant, but trust me, it's not because of what it produces. The second thing that he talks about is the power of yeast, right? I'll remind you of the scripture. He says, it's like the, the woman who's baking bread. Go and put the scripture up there. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. And, and we, we don't have a, a whole lot of time left today. But, but looking at yeast, we have to understand that, you know, when Jesus is using this metaphor, this comparison, Yeast doesn't work by sprinkling it on the outside. Like it doesn't take a lot. A little leaven leavens the whole loaf. It doesn't take a lot. But what it does require is to be mixed in well. It doesn't work from the outside in because it works from the inside out. 
The kingdom of heaven is like this. It's like the, the leaven that when allowed to permeate, when mixed in well, leavens the whole loaf and brings about transformation to the entire loaf, not from the outside in, but from the inside out. See, sometimes I think we can come to church and we can think that the kingdom of heaven is like behavior modification. And if I just don't do this anymore, then everything will be good. If I could just have this job, then I'll have peace in my heart. If I could just have this relationship, then all the, the love and the joy that I've been looking for is going to take care of itself. If I could just clean up the outside, then, then everything, it'll make me feel better about myself. And if I feel better about myself, then, then everything is going to be okay. And the kingdom of heaven does not work that way. The kingdom of heaven is not about behavior modification. It's about heart transformation. But the only way it can transform our heart is if we, we allow it to penetrate our heart. We allow the work to be done from the inside out. This is what Jesus said to the Pharisees, right? He, he called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs. That you're cleaned up on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead people's bones. He would continue in, in Matthew chapter 23. He, he would continue in this thought. He said, in the, in the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous. But on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. On the outside, you might have it all together. On the outside, you might have people fooled. On, on the outside, you might think it's behavior modification. But, but, but what's going on inside of you? Because you haven't allowed the kingdom to penetrate your heart. It's the yeast that works from the inside out. Pharisees were doing behavior modification. Do this, don't do that. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to sacrifice. Here's when you come to church. Here's when you clearly don't come to church. Here's when you ask for healing. Here's when you don't ask for healing. It was about the rules and the regulations, and they had used this system to be a hammer. They used the law of Moses to be a hammer to beat people down and to kick people down and to keep them down. And Jesus comes on the scene, and he says, listen, this isn't what it's about because the kingdom of heaven is light. This is what the kingdom is. God works from the inside out like the yeast, but only if we would allow it to penetrate our hearts. See, I don't, I, don't always see, I don't always see what the Holy Spirit is doing in my life. I don't always recognize it. Sometimes I do, right? Like when you're driving down the road and that person cuts you off and you have that immediate thought, but the Holy Spirit's like, no, like, that's not nice. You shouldn't think that. I'm like, ah, but I want to think it. I know, but it's not okay. When that, that coworker comes into your cubicle and they leave and you want to you wanna say something either to them or about them and the Holy Spirit's like, no, don't say that. Like, but I want to say it. I know you want to say it, but you shouldn't say it. That's not nice. Don't say that. Oh, okay. You, you know, you're in an argument with your spouse. It's like, no, she's wrong. I'm a wait. I'm a wait if she humbles herself. I'm a wait, see if she apologizes. See how long she can last without me talking to her. And the Holy Spirit's like, are you five? <laughs> you go and apologize. No, nope, I wasn't wrong. Yes, you were. I don't want to apologize. I didn't ask if you wanted to. I told you to do it. <laughs> You're like, I'm sorry. Hey, sometimes we see it because in the in in those moments, right? We're like, okay, I recognize that that's not me. That's you. But then there's things that he does beneath the surface that, that I, I will never see in the process. The same way that when you put that yeast in that dough, you can come back and you can look at it and you can check on it. You don't, you don't, 
you don't see the chemical reaction that's taking place as heat is introduced. You just see the goodness of it. Like, I don't always see it. Do you know who does though? My wife and my kids and the people that I'm close to. Because the old John would have, but something's different. I kind of like this new John. I don't really know what's going on, but, but I can notice a change. It's, it's the same way that, you know, you put those cinnamon rolls in the oven and you, you, you put them there and it's just, it's this hard little lump of dough. And yet you, you wait and you come back 10 minutes later because you haven't eaten in 21 days because you've been fasting and you turn on the light to the oven. And when you turn on the light, you see the, the golden brown goodness in the cinnamon running out of the dough and just pouring out over the sides as the oil that was poured on the head and dripped down to the beard and the vanilla, the icing that you just, come on, Jesus. Some of you are like, I don't bake. Okay, it's like the pizza rolls that you put into the microwave and you stand there in stock for 60 seconds while they're heating. Like something's happening. It's bubbling. There's goodness about to be ready. You know what I'm talking about? It's the same way the Holy Spirit works in our hearts. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. Because if you would allow the Holy Spirit to penetrate your heart and your life, like that yeast, he will begin to transform not just one area, but the entire thing. He will not just penetrate, you know, in your mind, but he'll start penetrating in, in, in the way that you feel and the way that you think and the way that you act and the way you respond in different situations. And it's not, just, it's not just about helping me in this relationship, but he will give you grace in every relationship. That's when the love and the joy and the peace, the patience and the kindness and the goodness and the gentleness and the faithfulness and the self-control and the fruit that the spirit produces in our lives begins to be produced when we allow him to penetrate our heart and do just that. Jesus, what's the kingdom like? This is what it's like. It's like cinnamon rolls in the oven. You don't really see what's happening, but you recognize when it's working. And it doesn't start out as much. I wouldn't eat it. <laughs> I wouldn't eat it fresh out of the fridge, fresh out of the package. But you give that thing 20 minutes at 400 degrees and mm, somebody about to be filled with the Holy Spirit right now. <laughs> but it requires some things of us. It requires us surrendering to his will. It requires us dying to ourselves. It requires us to, to allow him to put us through some of those fiery situations where our faith is tested and our endurance has a chance to grow and we want to be gritty, but we don't want to go through the fire. We want the goodness without, without going through the oven. Listen, you don't get it without it. We have to be willing to surrender ourselves and submit our desires and our hopes and our plans and say, God, your way is better than mine. So what do I do today with this message, Pastor John? You take the seed of the kingdom that's been planted in your heart and you nurture it. There is a seed that, that might seem insignificant, might seem really small. You might walk out and think, well, I didn't really learn a whole lot today. But the word says that, that his word does not return void, but it accomplishes the purpose that it was sent out for. And if we would be that fertile soil that is that seed is planted in our lives, it would produce fruit, much fruit and fruit that remains. But you got to nurture that seed. How do I do that? Get in his word, read the Bible. What's that going to do? Everything. Seems insignificant. So does that mustard seed. Come back for pursuit night tonight. We're going to gather. We're going to, we're going to share testimonies. We're going to celebrate with one another, encourage one another. We're going to worship together. We're going to pray together. It's just going to be a time for us as, as a, a, a body of Christ, as a group of believers, as a family, to gather and to celebrate the, the, the end of the fast. And here's what God is doing. Get into a small group. Start serving. I don't know what God is challenging you in and what that next step is for you, but take it. Why? Because I'm nurturing the seed that was planted in my life. It seems small, but I know that he's able to produce something great in and through me. And then what else do we do? We submit to the leaven. 
We open up our heart and say, Holy Spirit, have your way. Whatever you want to do, transform my mind. I don't want to conform to the patterns of the world, but I want to be transformed by your word, by the renewing of my mind. I can't make myself look like Jesus. I can't transform myself into the image of Christ, but do you know who can? The Holy Spirit. Same way that you can in the same way that you need him. This morning, nurture the seed and submit to the leaven. Submit to the yeast. Nurture and submit and allow God to do what only he can do. The point where not only do you see, do those around you see, but everybody sees something's different. Something's changed because the power of the kingdom at work in our lives. Amen. Stand with me this morning, if you would. I want to give you an opportunity to respond to faith, by faith, and in faith. You know, the Bible says it's the, the mustard seed. Jesus said, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed. And if you're here today and your life needs to be transformed, you need God to produce something in you. You need God to transform and to change your life. You've, you've tried behavior modification. You've tried to do it on your own and you've done nothing but make a mess of it. Today, you wanna to place your faith in Jesus. I'm not gonna have you bow your head. I'm not gonna have you close your eyes, but I'm gonna ask you with boldness and with courage in your heart, with everybody looking around to say, you know what? That's me. And I've tried it my own way and I'm tired of doing it my own way. Today, I wanna to take my mustard seed of faith and place it in Jesus and allow that mustard seed of his kingdom to take root in my heart to produce something in me. If you're here today and you want to, to give your heart to the Lord or maybe you need to recommit your life to the Lord, would you do me a favor? Just raise your hand. I wanna pray with you. I wanna pray for you, but I wanna know who I'm praying with. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands all over the place. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna pray a very simple prayer. And there's nothing, it's not the words of the prayer, but it's the heart that we pray with. And it's a, just a prayer of repentance. It says, God, I was living this way, but I'm changing, I'm turning from that, and I wanna live for you. It's a prayer of confession, recognizing that we're all sinners in need of a savior. And it's a prayer of acceptance accepting the, the free gift that he gives, the gift of salvation, surrendering to him. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? And would you pray with me if you raise your hand, even if you didn't, you know you should have, you wanted to. Church, if you're out there, would you help us to pray today? Just pray, just say, Jesus, thank you so much that you didn't come just to change a religious system but you came to establish your kingdom. Thank you that you gave up your life so I could have new life in you. And today I confess and I repent. I am a sinner in desperate need of saving. Thank you that you paid that price. Thank you for the gift that you offer. Today I place my faith in you. I receive you as my savior, but also as my Lord. Help me daily to surrender my life to your will, to your ways, and to your word, living for you from this day forward in Jesus' name. Let me pray for you today. Lord, I thank you for those that prayed that prayer. God, the hands that went up all over this room and those that didn't, but they prayed from their heart. Lord, your word says that if we would call upon the name of the Lord, that we would be saved. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, and Lord, today we take our mustard seed, and we give it to you. And we ask that that seed of the kingdom would, would grow within us. We ask that, that that yeast would work within us, bringing about the transformation that we so desperately need. Transform us into your image. We love you and we thank you. And be with the bills today, we pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 Hey, listen, pursuit night tonight, six o'clock. Make sure you're here. You're not going to miss it. Love you guys. 
At Dream City Omaha, we're all about helping each other do three things. Discover Christ, recover identity, and uncover purpose. Please check out our past sermon series or online discipleship classes. And don't forget to hit subscribe and the bell for notifications on all of our latest videos.